sitting here at my desk this evening. I have in front of me all of these notes from the rod that pertain to King David and a typical David. Christ the cornerstone that sits on the throne of David. Uh, what I did was I went through the rod and I cut and pasted. I copied all of these statements into a word format and then I clipped out those statements that pertain to King David and then I went through them individually and I'm still going through them individually because it's a very overwhelming subject and I can see how some people have come to the conclusions that they have but one of the conclusions I did discover that struck me rather interesting which is a side issue but you can consider it the branch people say that the Holy Spirit is female and they go through the conjugations of the word for the Holy Spirit and they look at a phrase where Mrs. White says she and they call it the Holy Spirit well in 8 track page 71 brother Hodaf says the antitypical David there is the Holy Spirit that's an interesting thought David is a man's name and it is the Holy Spirit and I thought to myself I wonder how they justify that because there's another, a number of other references where we find that the Holy Spirit, Christ in you, the hope of glory, Colossians chapter 1 around verse 27, is talking about Christ. Christ the true interpreter, Christ who breathes the Holy Spirit down upon us, the Holy Spirit that feeds us the truth, the message for the hour, and they said it's a female. I just wonder how they did that. But in going through these notes here, I've noticed that before we get into them. I noticed that context is ignored by quite a few people that are studying the subject of David and they're not considering the time frames. They're using proof texts to prove something without looking at the whole chapter, without feeding upon every verse, every line, and every word. Context. They do like many people do to prove a point. They gather all the verses that they can find and they say, well, this proves the, that this position is correct. It doesn't prove anything. All it does is it proves that you gathered a whole bunch of verses. But what you did not do was read the thought and intent of the writer. And this is most important because oftentimes if we don't have a clear understanding of a subject and we don't have a commentator for it, then we must go back to the original writer and read the entire content of the message that he is providing or bringing to our attention. When we do that, we begin to understand what the writer is actually teaching as opposed to what we think he's teaching. The message teaches that in the Leviticus, the purpose of Brother Hodaf's organization was to prepare a throne for David to sit on. And then he goes on and he tells us that Christ, the son of David, sits on that throne. He also tells us that David sits on that throne. And then he tells us, he reminds us that Christ is the cornerstone and he sits on that throne and Christ is David. The fact that he is called the son of David indicates that he is the lineage of David. When we go back to his baptism by John, it says there, God spoke from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The word beloved in the Hebrew and Aramaic language is pronounced David, or Dawid. Dawid in the Aramaic, D-A-W-I-D. David, I believe in the Hebrew, D-A-V-I-D. So what did they hear that day? They, he they heard God say, This is David my son, in whom I am well pleased. The translators chose to use the word beloved. As we progress through this discussion, because I'm not going to call it a study, I'm going to call it a discussion. We're going to look at many of these statements in the context of the chapter. One of the paradoxes that we have is, Isaiah 3.5, it says, after many days, they will come back 
and they will choose David their king. Hosea 1.11 says they shall appoint a king over them. When we go through the rod, we find two things, two comments on them that are of interest. One, Victor Hodov states, the choosing of a king, King David, takes place in the ingathering time, today. And this is true. If you do not take Christ as your Savior and as your king today, you certainly won't do it in the kingdom either. You must do it today. You must allow the covenant agreement to take hold of your life, every aspect of it, everything that is written concerning the character of God, how he created us, why he created us, the importance of the dietary laws, the importance of the moral laws. They must be written upon the heart. The dietary laws restore you back to the condition that we were in in the Garden of Eden. We have a perfectly clean, healthy body, and there is no diseases or no toxins that are found in the brain that prohibit the Holy Spirit from communicating with you. That's a major, major issue to contend with. The moral laws are telling you the things that God does not do or God does do. God honors the, pa- the parents. Christ honored Mary before he died. He said, woman, behold thy son, somebody to take care of her. And then God does not murder people. He is not the author of murdering. God does not lie, spread rumors, or gossip. God is not an adulterer. God is not a coveter. God does not fornicate. God is not a thief. And when we abide by these characteristic laws, we cause problems for nobody. For absolutely nobody. And we have respect for everybody. We have so much respect that the love for ourselves emanate into our love for our fellow man. So in the ingathering time, we must choose our king. We must make that decision. It's not enough to be baptized and publicly profess something. We must profess it in our hearts. Then on the other hand, he turns around and he says, a pure people will in the kingdom choose their king. A pure people with clean hands and a pure heart A contrite and humble king will recognize their king, the visible king, the rod tells us, in the kingdom. They will see Christ and they will say, this is our God. This is our king. This man who took on humanity is our visible king and our God forever and ever. He is the chief cornerstone. For instance, here, symbolic code number 12. Numbers 8 and 9, page 10. When Christ was on earth, he had nothing to do with Zion. But in his kingdom, which he is soon to set up, he will be the, he is to be the precious cornerstone, the sure foundation, and will sit on the throne of David in Zion. Moreover, it is Christ and his people who will constitute the beginning foundation of the kingdom symbolized by the stone of Daniel 2, which is to smite the image on the feet and then grow up and become a great mountain. Notice here in this particular statement, he will sit on the throne of David. He is the cornerstone. In another statement, which we will come to eventually, it says he is the visible king in the kingdom. So those who think they will not see him in the kingdom need to reconsider their position. The rod is very clear that you will see him in the kingdom. The subject, as I looked, as I have been looking at it, pointed out clearly, and I must reiterate it again, time and place, time frame, context. Ezekiel 34, for instance. And I will raise up, I will be the Lord their God and David my servant. Victor Hodes says this cannot be Christ because the message calls him the son of David. Well, when I come to this and I show you, Victor Hodes points out that all of Ezekiel 34 is in the gathering time, in the time when there's movers and shovers, in the time when there are those who take positions of 
little popes. In the time when there are those among the laity who are being high-minded, in the time when there are those among the ministry and the movers, the, pe- the people who are considered the movers and shakers, there are those that are high-minded. In that day, God will take the reins in his own hands. That's Ezekiel 34.11. I, even I, in the days of the false shepherds, will feed my flock. This is a gathering time experience. So, of course, it cannot be Christ the visible king. Not at that time. It is Christ the invisible king, who is also called the Holy Spirit. This is borne out in track 8. Page 71, in the day that there are those who send the message that's saying, we will not have this man to rule over us. And Victor Hodov says, this man is the invisible king, the antitypical David, the Holy Spirit. So, my friends, my brethren, in the gathering time, Christ is invisible because he is sending the message through the Holy Spirit to work upon our hearts. And as I go through all of these notes, I want to share that with you. Christ in us, the hope of glory, is what Paul says in Colossians 1.27. So I hope that as you listen to this study or to this discussion, that you will bear with me, this old man of many years, and you will open up the rod and you will look at these various statements, and I pray that you will consider them in the context of the writer. In the context of the prophets, let the prophets be your guide in the manner with which they have delivered their message. God bless.